Happy Holidays! My name is John. I hope all of you are healthy and well and enjoying this cheery time of year with your loved ones and the ones you hold dear. Once again, I've fallen back into the world of MC Dev, this time with a much more straightforward backstory. Some friends and I wanted to build a small fiefdom, complete with a keep and surrounding town. Upon building a handful of houses, I quickly realized that paths would be a necessary construction to give the town any amount of life. Paths. My bane. Despite tutorial upon tutorial, upon guide, upon server plugin, upon mod, I have but only once or twice sniffed the rare air high above the despair of my less than fair town squares. So I decided to prepare to climb the stairs of learning how to build half-decent paths. I would sit down, roll up my sleeves, and figure out how to make it so I would never have to build a path again. What, do you think I was going to learn a skill? No. This is a place for over-engineering simple problems until something worth sharing emerges. The word town is believed to have emerged from the German Saun, the Dutch town, and the Old Norse... Wait, I think this segment is too broad. Listen, just because I'm doing these title cards doesn't mean that this is going to turn into a video essay channel. If you want an expert opinion on medieval architecture, this is almost certainly not the place. The build team on the server came up with the following list of buildings for the hypothetical residents of our town to use. In addition to the central keep, our town would have... Now, that's a lot of important locations, some of which our hypothetical residents would use more frequently than others, and some of which more of our hypothetical residents would use than others. For example, we can expect that only around three residents would be going to and from any given house, but that a majority, if not all, of our residents would be crossing through the town square. The point here is that paths should change dynamically to reflect their use. This is a concept which brings me to... Quick backstory here. One of my first major projects in the MC Dev community was working on a project known as Game Mode 4. The lead developer of which was Sparks from Accidental Games. He's a cool dude, and I did a panel with him at Minecon one year. Check him out if you haven't already. Game Mode 4 was a set of easily added modules that enhanced vanilla gameplay without straying too far from the aesthetic of the base game or becoming overly complicated. Or, in the case of my teleporters, required a PhD in understanding the unfiltered creativity of a middle schooler, but. Despite that, GM4 was a fantastic project, and one of the earliest published modules was titled Desire Lines. The module, intended to be used mainly in a multiplayer setting, accomplished precisely the solution to the problem I introduced in the last part. By progressively eroding grass blocks into more and more path-like blocks, natural paths would begin to emerge where players walked frequently, and would be widest and largest where players walked the most. Grass turns into dirt, which will either regrow into grass if the path isn't favored, or, if it is favored, will turn into coarse dirt, then a path, and finally into cobblestone or gravel. The concept of desire lines wasn't created by GM4, it's a natural phenomenon, which you'll see most often while hiking on natural trails. I believe that this mimicry of real life is why the module works so well in Minecraft. So. Armed with the code from this module, all we need to do is find a way to create. Now, pathfinding in Minecraft is notoriously tough. Googling around will find you a wide range of possible solutions, but each with their own issues. I'll present a few of them now. Solution 1 is zombie villager pathfinding, or more generally, predator-prey pathfinding. This possible solution assigns targets to hostile mobs, conscripting them to calculate a valid route using Minecraft's internal pathfinding algorithm, and then venture forth. Sliced Lime put together a competent documentation of this process in one of his videos, but I'll put the highlights here. Essentially, the method works off of UUID manipulation, using a snowball with a throne tag housing the same UUID as the target entity to damage a hostile, causing it to pathfind to the only remaining entity in the world with the UUID as the snowball it was attached with. Here are the pros to this solution. Making use of the internal pathfinding algorithm means we don't need to write our own, which is an inherent benefit. Although it's not that computationally demanding, we can have more agents running without running into lag issues. We'll touch a bit more on this soon. 
Triggering the pathfinding is fairly reliable, and we also get some flexibility when it comes to mob choice. The cons, however, we realize that although we do get some of that flexibility, agents must be hostile mobs, so we don't have complete artistic freedom when it comes to selecting the wandering civilian agent. An internal algorithm means that we have much less control over the paths and are bound by the flaws already present in the model, again which we'll touch on later. Perhaps the biggest con, though, to this system is the one which Slice Slime has brought up in his video, that messing with UUIDs in general is not usually a good idea. Having two entities with the same UUID can corrupt a world, requiring external tools like MCEdit to fix it. This means that we would need to write code that ensures no two UUIDs are the same, which, while possible, is an annoying thing to have to consider. As you may already have noticed, many aspects of this algorithm come with inseparable pros and cons. If the solution makes use of the internal pathfinding algorithm, that inherently creates both good and bad aspects of the solution for us, just as creating a custom algorithm would. Our final choice won't be a clear-cut intersection of the best of the previously established solutions, rather it will be more about minimizing the cons of all of them. This brings us to solution 2, A-star pathfinding. A-star pathfinding employs a well-documented mathematical pathfinding system to programmatically search the world for the best route. I'm not going to explain A-star in this video, it's a topic that other videos have covered extensively. One thing to note, though, is that Minecraft's internal pathfinding is a modified version of A-star, although not much is known beyond it being terribly inefficient and in dire need of an update. Here are the pros of writing our own A-star pathfinding system. Creating our own algorithm means that we would have full control over the pathfinding. We could, for example, make it so our mobs avoid a certain block while going to their destination. Full control over our civilian entity selection is also something we need to consider. If we're writing our own algorithm, we can use anything we want to draw these paths. However, we also have to take a look at some of the cons. A-star and any other self-made algorithm would need serious engineering to make it feasible for any normal computer in Minecraft. These algorithms, especially using Minecraft's programming language, are slow, inefficient, and computationally demanding. Furthermore, if visualization of the agents is wanted, playback of the path would need to be done via teleportation, which, while not the worst, certainly leaves something to be desired with respect to general jankiness. While seeing previous implementations of A-Star into Minecraft is beyond impressive, watching a video on these implementations introduces a glaring issue. These computations take a lot of time and slow down the game a ton. If we want to have more than 3-5 to five agents at a time, this solution is almost certainly out. We could look at some other pathfinding algorithms, but I know A-Star is somewhat implementable in MC and I can't say the same with certainty for others. I'm only going to call this one a pseudo-solution, but uh, the third approach is the traffic sign approach. I hate to really even call this a solution because it requires some level of building to control the algorithm, and probably takes more work than it's worth. Essentially, the concept behind the solution is that you can create signs made of certain blocks placed on the floor that, when an entity steps on them, they start to move in a certain direction that was specified via teleportation until they hit another sign. Dragnaz did a video on something very similar to this, but to summarize, for our pros, there's not really an algorithm at play here, so we have full control over the path of the agents. Uh, we also, of course, get full control over the civilian entity selection, which again is something that would be nice considering that a possible use of this whole data pack would be to visualize civilians walking around a town. Finally, playback of the paths looks mostly fantastic, as teleportation is relative coordinate based, not entity based like Solution 2. However, let's look at the cons. Does this even count as pathfinding? We're defining the path before the agents are even spawned. Uh, paths will have little variation or natural feel to them, as once an agent is on the path, they will take the same block by block path to the destination as all the previous agents. Paths will be narrow and rigid as a result. During playback, also, it would be difficult to deal with any verticality in the paths without putting in leeway for a motion tick, which might cause visual jank with the playback. Okay, okay, enough dragging this out, let's talk about solution 4. My solution. Alright, 
So, if you know anything about Minecraft's pathfinding, you're probably mad that I haven't mentioned this one yet. You're also probably mad that I'm calling it my solution, to which I say, too bad, dislikes are gone, you piece of peace. But yeah, this very obvious solution to this would be to use wandering traders. Wandering traders allow us to take the best parts of solution 1 while shedding most of the issues with it. For those of you who are unfamiliar, wandering traders have this cool bit of NBT called Wander Target with three child properties x, y, and z. These properties store coordinates of a target block and calls upon Minecraft's pathfinding function to evaluate an efficient path. Alright, I plan to dedicate the second half of this video to a full code review, so for now let's just... Okay, code is done, let's talk about... Okay, so you drop the data pack in the folder and you load up the world and hit the chat with the slash reload. Then, if you did everything right, this pops up. So you make sure your hotbar is clear and you click the link and boom bam, now you've got all these tools. Head down to a point of interest and right click with this to make a waypoint. Head somewhere else and do it again. Hold this one to see where your waypoints are. Go somewhere else and do it again. Mess it up, use this one to delete one. The barrier symbol appears on the one that will be deleted. Fix the placement and boom, now we have three waypoints. Now let's spawn some agents with this one. One, two, three, four, five, there they go, off on their way to make some paths. Want to change how long they linger at the waypoints? Use this command, scoreboard player set idle time, jlv underscore clock 100. The default value is 200, which is about 10 seconds of idling. I'll get more detailed into this in the code review. Want to change how quickly paths are made? Scoreboard player set path chance, jlv clock 3. The default value is 5. Lowering the number lowers the number of rolls necessary to increment the block below. Set it to 0 for 100% path generation, or to 999 for no paths and just the wandering agents. Want to change the blocks involved with the path or the evolution of the path? Navigate to this file in the data pack and insert some code. Now let's look at some... Here's a time lapse of the data pack running on a super flat with 5 waypoints for 10 minutes with increased path chances and a low idle time. Here's the same thing but with a sparse forest instead of the super flat. Here's some agents wandering around a pre-built city with no path generation. Brings a lot of life into the village, right? By the way, this map is uh, Land of Adraria, which is the same map I used in my last video. Note that some extra waypoints were added to the marketplace in the town square to have a higher concentration of agents there at any given time. And here is the route map generated by them walking around for about an hour. You can clearly see in this annotated map how they avoid houses and water features unless there's a path through it, like the city hall. And that about wraps up the demo of the features. Much more simplistic than last year's D&D toolkit, but still useful, I hope. If you're interested in how it works, stick around just a bit longer for the... Okay. I'm going to assume if you're watching this, you have some basic knowledge of how data packs are set up. Also, I'll be going through all of this very quickly, so feel free to pause and rewind whenever you need. First off, I assign our living village init function to Minecraft load and living village main to Minecraft tick. Within init, I initialize the scoreboard objectives wander pause, clock, and interest. I also set some constants and allow advanced players to change the default settings here without needing to run commands in game. Finally, I print a tell raw confirming the install with a link to run the get items function. Within get items, I give the user the spawn eggs for the interactive functions and the eye of ender for the passive function. All of them either have pre-inserted tags or NBT tags so that they can be targeted as an item special to this data pack. Oh, uh, by the way, if you haven't noticed already, I'm using the prefix JLV underscore, which stands for John's Living Villages. Now, heading over to main, I first take care of all of the item functions. Pretty standard procedure here with the 20Hz function, recognizes the existence of an entity with the JLV spawn POI. POI means point of interest, a name that was replaced on the front end with waypoint, replaces it with a more permanent and useful marker entity and kills off the trigger entity. 
Now, uh, for the particles, I just execute off of players holding items with my custom NPT tags and have the particles spawn at nearby relevant entities. Now I update the clock, which has a default maximum of the idle timer parameter. How fast idle timer ticks down scales with the number of agents, such that, on average, a given agent will spend about idle timer ticks idling around a waypoint. If the clock is zero, we choose a random agent and have it undergo the idle test function. Now let's take a moment to look at idle test. First things first, we grab its current X and Z position from its NBT and store that on a scoreboard. Then we grab its target waypoint X and Z position via the wander target NBT and put that on the scoreboard as well. Uh, with these numbers, we can then perform a difference test to see how close it is to zero. After testing, I made an informed decision to set the radius of the target to be about 10 blocks. This can be expanded and contracted to your needs on line 16 of the idle test function, but 10 seems to work best for pre-built towns and non-super flat worlds. 5 works better for super flat. Finally, we need to consider that in vanilla, when a wandering trader reaches its destination, it loses interest, the NBT tag gets destroyed, and so we test to make sure that the trader even has a target. If the trader is either inside its target's radius or doesn't have a target, it is given a tag to indicate that it needs to be assigned a target later on in the code. Finally, the clock is reset to its maximum. Wandering back over to our main function, I decide to throw in an interest level for our agents. It defaults to 5 minutes and primarily serves to fix the issue that MC defaults pathfinding is kinda ass, and sometimes agents will never reach their goal on the path they chose. After 5 minutes, the agent will be assigned a different target and will hopefully unstuck itself. Next, we resolve the idle and bored agents. Each tagged agent runs the new wander pause function, which we'll check out now. Within new wander pause, we essentially choose a random waypoint, grab its x, y, and z coordinates, and then stuff those into the agent's wander target NBT. Finally, we reset the interest level of the agent and perform some cleanup. At this point, we have agents wandering around our waypoints like good little civilians. The only thing left is to have them execute our desire lines code. While our idle clock scales with the number of agents, the desire lines scale with the number of waypoints. You can always spawn more agents to increase your path chance, but if you have one agent and two waypoints, a path would form a lot quicker than if you had one agent and five waypoints without this correction term. Anyways, for each waypoint we evaluate a predicate, which is just a fancy way of rolling some dice in Minecraft, with a default chance of 0.5%. This may seem small, but it occurs at 20 hertz, so it's actually a 10% chance every second, or about one block update every 10 seconds. If the predicate is successful, we subtract one from our rolls left variable, with a maximum of path chance. When rolls left hits zero, we run the desire lines function. Within the desire lines function, we essentially just choose a random agent and progress the block they're standing on by one evolution in our path development tree. We also run a predicate for any point in the path that can split into multiple blocks, like how my default path handles the final stage of the path. We do a bit of cleanup here, and that's it. That's all the code. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making this tool and getting to talk to you all about it. Let me know in the comments what you think, and if you know someone you think would appreciate this, do me a favor and link them over here. All of the code I wrote is linked in the description, as well as a list of all my sources. Otherwise, I hope you have a joyous holiday season, spend time with your loved ones, and be kind to one another. You might hear from me again soon, you might not, but I'm sure I'll be back eventually. Until then, this has been John, signing off for now. And as always, thanks for watching.